Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to the talk tonight. And I um, please interrupt me at any point if you have questions. And I definitely welcome questions at the end. So um, I I always begin with this uh, this work that I started in 2001, and. I'm sure that most of you who have had your first exhibition, your first solo exhibition, know the kind of anticipation and the excitement and the kind of uh, work leading up to an exhibition in the way that you are kind of completely in it. So um, this was the first time that I made um, a wall painting. I'd always made paintings on traditional stretchers and canvases. So in this one exhibition, I had made this 40-foot um, wall painting. And it was made with um, joint compound and pigment and it responded. And it was a very metaphorical kind of landscape. Uh, and, uh, and what was interesting to me and remains interesting to me is the kind of um, relationship that we have, that I have with painting, is that you create um, a frame to look into, and then that frame creates a certain kind of, uh, I don't know, intermediary uh, space between your, the real space of, of a room and then the space of a painting. Um, and it creates a certain kind of, or requires, rather, a certain kind of belief in, this, in the color world, in the space of the aesthetics. And so in the course of this, uh, this exhibition, um, well, actually not in the course of, in, in the making of the work, which I was in the gallery for about a month making the work, and it was supposed to open on September 11th, 2001. So of course, you know, all of that, I'm just going to go back to the, the image of the, the painting just to talk about the idea of the ways in which um, belief in what we're doing, <laughs> or what I'm doing, um, both filled up and completely emptied out. Of course, like the real life collective catastrophe that our city went through made the, the, the painting and the opening seem so superficial and, and, and really meaningless. And I thought, you know, it, it was like three weeks into the exhibition where the kind of I guess you know when you're working on a wall, also it will be erased at the end of the show. So the ways in which the painting itself became a very ephemeral experience, and that it would be erased, and the kind of condition of the world and the condition of New York City suddenly made the painting feel again, it would f it, it filled back up with meaning. So I continued to think about the ways in which painting is both of the those kind of simultaneous. Um, filled and empty at the same time. So I returned to my studio having, you know, had this kind of pivotal moment with my own work and kind of having a crisis with what, what to do next. So I went back to my studio and, you know, I really liked the experience of thinking about painting as the container of a painting perhaps being a room. So I started painting in my studio and not long after um, making this painting, I realized that it was such a ridiculous kind of gesture because the thing that I loved about making a painting in the gallery was that it had to respond to the walls and the ceiling and the architecture of the space and the conditions that existed within that, the gallery. And then you go back into your studio space and what you have is your, the privacy of your own constructed um, space. And uh, shortly after that, my landlord, it was in Williamsburg, uh, it told us that we needed to leave the space. So I decided to take um, all the walls with me. So what I did was I just deconstructed the painting and then uh, propped it and leaned it and created a, a kind of painting that suddenly it began to unfold in my own imagination is that the door was a kind of exit, entry, the, and that could also be a painting space. And so that the, the, the difficulty of having a, like a competitive, the competition of both the imagery and real space kind of functioning at the same time was, um, it created a, a certain kind of tension in the painting that I, f that I find interesting. So I wanted to flatten 
like the pipes into the painting space and the window shades and talk about the kind of precarious nature of the built environment and of sheetrock and and of course the idea that sheetrock was very temporal to me became much more tender in relationship to that time and that place. So I continue to think about ways in which to deconstruct the wall, both with a paintbrush and then with a knife. And every time I cut into the wall, I was anticipating that there would be some kind of magic behind the wall. And, you know, it's just the other side of the sheetrock. <laughs> so, you know, in, in many ways, it's the, the, the illusion that of the painting space in relationship to the tension of real space, which was what propelled me to continue to kind of Take, take the wall apart and take the space apart and think about like the, the boundaries and the framework of where, where things begin and end. This was a piece called Strip and uh, it was at White Columns Gallery. So this is a piece called um, Architecture Shadows. So I guess, you know, as you, as we all work, we take on different kinds of vocabulary and different kinds of questions in our work. So I was thinking about, you know, the precarious sheetrock leaning, leaning against a wall uh, and wondering where, where illusion began and ended. But then I started to think about the kind of precarious structures that are built in shadows of buildings and the kinds of, uh, the, the ways in which those exist in space both as I don't know, as, as a kind of a reminder of the kind of formal, formal ways in which we build space and then the informal ways in which we inhabit it. So this was built like one of those accordion sketchbooks where it kind of folds out, so it was two-sided. And because it was made with construction material, it, I, I kept thinking about the, um, d the delight of thinking about uh, making a painting that's both a book and a fort. So. Then this was at um, the Brooklyn Museum. And I think that you know, part of my insistence uh, or my delight in making a painting on a wall uh, and carving into the wall has to do with a kind of claustrophobia. And, and that the, the ways in which you, or maybe you know, even like the, a painting is a way, uh, like an entry or an exit so that you could enter into the painting into another kind of space. So I, with these works, I continue to kind of to try to find um, a vaster panorama or a vaster view. So I crawled up onto the um, the rooftop of the Brooklyn Museum to um, just to get a sense of the where I was inside of the space, and then I made this painting that reflected the kind of industrial landscape, almost like this sea of of smoke, so that the so that the joint compound became a kind of um, negative, empty space. This painting is called um, to, to the Limits. And I guess, you know, in many ways, I felt like the paintings that I was, that I'm, that I was making on the found material, and in this case, it was uh, cabinet really heavy cabinets that were stacked on one another and so they were very precariously uh, held together um, and very dependent upon the wall were they were sort of failures <laughs> because they didn't really exist as painting space and they certainly weren't architectural and they weren't sculptural either so they were like my yearning for something that was both beyond painting but that would still speak to a kind of, well, in this case, a, a kind of domestic, the precariousness of this kind of domestic material. So um, I started uh, to, to think about the ways in which architect architecture actually um, shapes, or space, space itself shapes um, and constructs our lives and thinking about the kind of code that is, with, that is in architecture itself. So when I was asked to do a project at the uh, Aldrich Museum, I started to think about, well, A, all the, the homes around the Aldrich 
look like this. They're, you know, it's a very uh, wealthy neighborhood, and the, it's, the mansions are gated. And I kept thinking about the code of the gate and the kind of the, the, the perfection of the architecture being a kind of mirror to the perfection that the people who live there would want from their lives. And so then I wanted to compare um, that to other areas of Connecticut. So, whoops. I guess I traveled around to um, Danbury and Bridgeport and uh, other kinds of um, cities and urban spaces and thought about the ways in which we all negotiate, um, that those spaces are negotiated. So, so here you see a space, I think this is in Bridgeport, and um, you can see the way you know, material is reused and there's a kind of economy and you know, repainting to create some kind of aesthetic from from the overlap. And so what I did was I used this silhouette of that first house and I created like this whole like using joint compound and then I created uh, all of these kind of planar uh, moments in which to enter the space. And the piece is called A House of Many Mansions. And so the nice thing about the Aldrich was it, it is a single, it was a single family house and then it became a house a community house as a museum. And so I thought it was appropriate for this piece um, to, to be in this, in this space. And there was many different kind of vantages. And, and it was quite rough. And the museum had just kind of remodeled. So it was great to have the opportunity to kind of fuck it up. <laughs> and also, you know, the, just like this, the way in which, um, especially in that, that piece, the way in which the abstraction actually played with the architecture to me became a kind of ongoing uh, interest. So then I decided to take the same idea of using the silhouette and when I was asked to do um, a, a wall piece again in Richmond, Virginia, I decided to use the silhouette of the White House because of course that is a very loaded uh, piece of architecture, and I thought that it would be very interesting, actually, to take the White House apart. So I, um, but it, with this piece, you know, you you never, you know, when you, when you work within within a space or you're given a space, people forget to tell you all of the kind of important details that affect the piece. So when I carved into the space, I could only fold back like the inch of sheetrock and then you know the wall behind it was right there so it really became a kind of house of cards which which was really interesting because it felt even more kind of hemmed in and um, kind of singular in a way even though I tried to keep deconstructing it and laying cutting into the wall and painting sky so this is I don't know maybe people are familiar with this space at PS1 so um, I was asked to do um, a piece and I decided to create a threshold. So I built this um, sheetrock wall. So lots of people missed the piece, of course, because it doesn't really look like much. <laughs> but those people who didn't had to press their faces up against all of the, the very small apertures. And um, I guess I was thinking about the ways in which um, real space could then become abstracted space because when you when you restrict the vision so so much the space within there even if you're looking at n different rooms becomes flat flattened like a painting so it was interesting to kind of think about the very uh, historical space uh, of the boil boiler room in PS1 and think about its its use as you know a schoolhouse, and I don't know what it was before that, but then to create a kind of fiction of the space, so you could see like where people kind of press their greasy faces up against there. And I also titled the piece like um, a real estate ad, so something like um, four BR, um, close uh, two skylight. Um, old school house building, uh, recent reno, um, must see, and then I left my phone number. So people actually called me when they were looking inside of the space, and they would, you know, talk to me about the piece, and and it was it was kind of great because they didn't anticipate also that I would answer the phone, <laughs> and um, 
So this is the view if you were able to step inside of it. And so it was actually several different kind of uh, interiors that, that uh, created a fiction that you were looking into perhaps a home that was still inhabited by somebody or something that had been abandoned. And I used um, Tyvek and wallpaper to create a kind of collage on the actual walls. So that um, after the show ended, I actually just peeled all of the paper off the walls and reused it in different pieces, which has become uh, something that I really that I that I really value in my own work is the ways in which um, my own work collapses into other pieces, and also you know using that idea of collapse in the work itself. So I started you know after working at PS One, I was just thinking about that wallpaper and what wallpaper does to an interior space and how wallpaper actually defines a certain kind of aesthetic and how it's usually the aesthetic of, of, a, of a woman, to, to generalize, but it feels safe to say that. Um, and then to think about, well, what if wallpaper actually became the shelter and, and, though, and still remained dependent and a kind of um, tumor on the wall? So this piece of like begins with the pile of newspaper that then becomes the wallpaper shelter. I think I called it crossword. And this is called for rent. And the bottom is sheetrock that's just kind of folded into a semicircle. And, um, and then this is a, a Trump loyal uh, repainted sign. And I guess the the economy of, of the shelter or the economy of urgent architecture was something that I wanted to refer to with these pieces and um, the ways in which people need to possess um, their own space and ways in which people do it really creatively and with, with, a, with a kind of beauty. So I'm always um, kind of torn between working in the studio and then working outside of the studio. And I guess for me, the conversation is about the arbitrary. And I find that the more I work outside of the studio, um, the more kind of liberating it is then to come back to the studio and apply some of the conditions that uh, determine the work when you need to kind of respond to the condition outside of the studio to studio work. So these were collages that I made in 2007. And just thinking about the, the paper and the, the painted tape and the imagery and the ways in which you know, the thing you think that should have more resonant kind of, um, an, uh, what's the word, um, authenticity. Um, meaning like I thought that the photograph itself would like give the piece its kind of place. But it was actually like the more formal elements were like the painted tape or the things that felt more kind of tangible than really kind of gave the pieces their, their moment in some ways. So th these, um, these next two slides are from uh, Albania, and I guess I'm showing these because I was became very interested in the idea that that painting can exist in social space and and change the way people actually connect to their own city or uh, or kind of civic life. And I guess in um, Eddie Rama, who is a, the mayor of Turgenia, I'm forgetting the name of the Tirana. Tirana thank you. Um, I guess supplied paint in in a time um, where there there wasn't that much money for the rehabilitation of these kind of war torn buildings, and um, created these kind of unbelievable revitalized structures. And I was just very interested in the kind of simplicity of that gesture and how how that could how painting could actually create some kind of real difference in in space. So. I've spent um, several summers up in, in Maine, in Skowhegan, 
and well, this was one summer when I was a resident at Skowhegan, and it was really interesting because I would steal away from campus and I'd go to this 5,000 square foot empty lot, which was a, a Dollar Tree, and I wanted to create a, a painting on the parking lot, and I started. Um, I wanted to respond to the kind of econ the economics of the empty lot, which is it's. I think I've been up there many, many times in the last 20 years, and it's, it's maybe used, I don't know, 20% occupancy. It's, it's almost always vacant. And um, just thinking about the way the community actually uses the space, which I guess tucked into the corners, you know, people kind of come there to do illicit things. And then, of course, you can see the way that there's like, you know, crazy marks from, you know, lots of uh, fast driving and so on. So I decided to use the facade, the blue facade, the color of the facade, and then paint the kind of um, natural erosion of the parking lot. And I have to say that, um, well, I was doing it with um, a friend, and we put on like our official Tyvek suits so that people would think that we should be there doing that, because we didn't ask permission. And it was really great because my friend took the position of the employee. So when Mainers came around and you know said, "What in the world are you doing?" He would just look up and say, oh, "Crazy, right?" You know, and they and uh, everyone could understand that, like he was being paid to do something idiotic, right? <laughs> but he was doing it. Um, and then I, I kind of took a different position, which was, you know, I'm making a painting, and um, so some people really thought I was a lunatic, <laughs> but other people were like, "Oh." That's really interesting because, of course, if you're on a parking lot, like the asphalt is glistening, and the, it was very present if you stood in a particular place, and it was almost like that first painting that I was describing, or where it's like it's both full and empty, meaning like if you stood in the right spot, it it just seemed like it had all of the eco the economics and all of the social um, kind of it, it carried all the weight of the place. And then when you stepped slightly to the right of it, it just completely evaporated. It, you couldn't see the, the painting. It just, and, and that is the problem, I guess, of working outside, which is that you know, the real space kind of eclipses a very small gesture on the space. But it's funny because you know, when you're on the parking lot and you're bending down and you're thinking about, well, should it be a hard edge or soft? Or you know, should the landscape of the weeds coming through be part of the painting? So all of those kind of small decisions actually become part of the work and kind of add to the, the content of the work as well. So, Let's see, how did I get from there to here? Um, I moved into another studio, and I was thinking about the kinds of ideas that I was thinking about in, the, in my other studio about privacy and about private space, and about how um, I was thinking about, well, I'm going to move into this studio, and I took down the old sheetrock in order to frame my studio and you know, put up the walls, and I found this, this amazing wallpaper which I had been waiting to find something amazing <laughs> behind a wall, and I finally found something. So I asked the construction workers to um, just to, to um, frame this space and that I was going to make a very private first painting there. And so I was you know, using um, joint compound and thinking about making tent paintings. And I, um, so I used this um, red and white striped um, bent sheetrock and applied it to the wall. And then when I had a, a visit from the curators from the Whitney Biennial, I told them that I wanted to make it double. So, which I didn't know how I was going to do that. I just said it. <laughs> so then I had to figure that out. So this is this, the painting in my studio. And this is the painting, a painting of a wall that I made for the Biennial. And it was a really interesting um, problem because, of course, when you frame something, you actually, you actually tell the viewer how to see something. You have to actually tell the viewer, this is a painting or this is an artifact. And I think because I had played with the way in which I had inserted it into the architecture of the museum, it, it had a kind of authenticity that people couldn't see it as artifice. 
They could only see it as artifact. So when you when people look close, it was silkscreen and watercolor, and it was completely constructed space. And all of the holes and all of the ways in which I was trying to you know, kind of destroy it or to mimic um, the kind of history that was in the original wall were all were all painted on there. And this was like actually the the, the first gesture that one the, the workmen who were who framed the wall in the studio, I had told them, you know, I, I want to frame this and because he had no understanding as to what I was doing, he immediately he was just standing there with a, you know, really thick white um, a, a paintbrush filled with white paint and just kind of tapped it out onto the wall. <laughs> And it was kind of a beautiful gesture because it was really about the ways in which we f value things. And um, so I thought that was a really appropriate first gesture on the wall. His like completely, you know, disregarding it as I was valuing it. And then the, the red and white striped um, sheetrock, that same pattern I had uh, painted on the stairway throughout the entire museum. So that you, the container, almost like a, the same kind, thinking along that lines of Daniel Buren about the framework of the institution and taking, allowing those lines to seep out of the container of the museum into the stairwell. And because the red and white stripe is sort of a, a very, um, it's a pattern that we see all the time on the subway platform, it's, it harkens to maybe, you know, the American flag or a circus tent. And so I wanted all of those kinds of associations to kind of, to freely be there. And then part of that biennial, uh, they had a, an auxiliary space at the armory. So I was thinking, um, I wanted to respond to the space of the armory is pretty fantastic. The drill hall is still used for for drills, maybe not anymore because it's become pretty much an art space, but at the time it was still used. So I looked into the history of the drill hall and found that if you see that on the far right side, the balcony, um, that is, it's called the, the piece is called the women's balcony, and that is the, the space in which, the only space um, for women in the arm, or attributed for women in the armory to look at the drills. And it was just like this really, abject little rectangle, rectangle. And, um, and I thought that it would be interesting to play with the, the view and play with the idea of a marginal view in relationship to the who has a view and who doesn't have a view. And so I used the colors in the room and closed, uh, closed as many views as I could. And um, so there's the, that balcony. And I painted the interior so that it would glow. So it became part of a kind of formal language of the, the abstract painting. And then on the fourth floor, there was an active um, women shel woman shelter. So I wanted to co connect those two kind of peripheral views uh, as one in the painting space. But of course, this is like a very subtle way in which to impact that wall or to speak about the history of the architecture. So I guess in my experience of, of working at the armory, I started, I wanted to continue to think about the idea of a view and who has a view. So I made a piece at the new museum and it was part of a show just at the moment when the new museum had moved onto the Bowery and the neighborhood was becoming gentrified. And the idea of um, the show was all that neighborhood. So there was four other institutions that were invited into the new museum over the course of two years. Um, it was the Townhouse Gallery in Cairo, the, Eind, um, the Abbey in uh, Eindhoven, and um, the, you know, the um, INSA in Seoul, and something in Mexico City, I'll remember in a minute. So wh what I was thinking was that uh, th this piece is called Line Up, and I wanted to begin in the interior of the museum on the education floor and just think about a line. And if it was a perfect world, you know, 
things could line up and collapse differences between spaces. So I asked to create a kind of line that would go th on onto the rooftops and over buildings and and go you know onto like far office buildings. So that was a proposal, and it was interesting because the curator said, "Yeah, yeah, sure, go ahead, do it." <laughs> Which I had no experience doing that, and basically she said, "Here's a letter. You know, basically you can go door to door." <laughs> And so I began thinking about, you know, Barry Restaurant, and they had a kind of dynasty right there. And I wanted to paint, you could see that very thin line on their rooftop. And I had like this, ex this great day of talking to uh, a retired uh, surgeon about painting the line on the yellow building. And he was like, it was like a magical experience. Like you sat down and you talked to him about the the strangeness of painting a line on the landscape and the significance of the color and the arbitrariness of, of that gesture and John Cage. And we just, we spent a long time talking and I kind of left there like, wow, this is gonna be really great and easy. And then I walked into the Barry, um, the Barry uh, restaurant supply place and there was this very big fellow sitting there and I should have stopped when I started to say, you know, I'm an artist and I'm doing a project in the new museum. You know, when I like noticed he had love on one hot hand and hate on the other tattooed. <laughs> and I got to like, and I want to get up on your rooftop just to paint a small line on the periphery. And he's like, forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I just felt like my whole interior kind of drop. Like, oh, <laughs> this isn't the same language. And I'm just, kind of incredibly stubborn. So if you see that guy um, standing on the gray rooftop, he was the security guard at the new museum. And so I was complaining in the lobby and I had been making drawings of the Barry restaurant supply place and I wanted to give it to them and maybe ask them if they'd let me get on the roof. And he heard about this and, and it turns out he was a cop in the Bronx and he said, they owe me favors. So he went over and he had like screaming matches because they were mafia, I think. And <laughs> the old, uh, this is what he described to me. They owe him favors and he had the screaming matches and the grandfather was just shaking his head and screaming in Italian. And finally, you know, they, 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 they said yes, right? And so here, we, here I am painting on the rooftop and this is the, the group. <laughs> <laughs> And the guy on the right, he's the guy with the tattoos. And so the show was supposed to be about neighborhood, and I'm sure, I'm sec I could securely say they've never gone into the new museum. <laughs> but they became part of the vocabulary of the piece. So, um, <laughs> yeah, and each building became a, a very particular negotiation uh, of ownership. And you, know, you could see how in this space, the, the green color jogs back and forth. And you know, so I had to go door to door and get permission. And I think that that became a really interesting kind of problem for the piece was that negotiation of ownership and real estate and thinking about a green line on real estate was very different than thinking about a green line on a page. So I started to think about, um, well, you could imagine that the green line went on much further than it did or I could actually send the green line much further than it should be. <laughs> so what I did was I proposed to send like a, I don't know, a large roll <coughs> of painted Tyvek um, to each one of the countries. And I asked for the line to be oriented in a particular direction with a compass so that in the perfect world, all of those lines would, would line up. Um, so here is a piece in Cairo. <laughs> And it was kind of magical because I never met Essam Abdullah, who helped to install these pieces. But his experience, of course, was completely different in Cairo. Um, he said that the color, um, that green, like seafoam green, was, it meant a lot. It was like, it had a symbolic meaning in the culture for prosperity and heaven. And so people were constantly, like the, all the trash on the rooftops was painted, you know, in this various shades of green. And he would just cut off little pieces of the Tyvek and give it to a store owner in order to get up on their rooftop. And everyone seemed to be, you know, 
they allowed him to do it, you know, whereas it was like months of negotiation for me. And he just had so much energy and interest in the piece. And then this was um, at Insa Gallery in, um, in Seoul, and the artist who helped me here had this really interesting um, discourse about the ways in which the line would, would traverse um, spaces that the public was not allowed to enter. So that was a private palace that the line then went up and over. So I guess you know the, the means for this, there was no budget for this project at all. But maybe that's what made it like all the more um, I don't know meaningful for me that it, it got done no matter how it you know just by by sheer will. And then the line, this is still soul, was, went through an outdoor gym. And I like the way it just took on the, the meaning of the context and where it traveled through. And then here's a kind of panoramic landscape in Seoul. And then in Eindhoven, the artist who helped me, uh, he was really funny because when I asked people to collaborate with me, I said, well, if, you, if you'll do this for me, I would perhaps help you out with a project, or I could, um, you know, if you come to New York, you could come and stay at my house. And so, you know, he, and you know, here's my ideas. And so he wrote me back and he said, um, "Do I have to agree with the piece to participate in it? And what kind of uh, like are you close to the subway? Is there a refrigerator? <laughs> what kind of bathroom? My own entrance?" And so I wrote him back and I said, "I said." Um, you don't have to agree with the piece, but you do have to want to do it. <laughs> and I'm offering you a bed of nails in Brooklyn. And he was like, I'm on board. <laughs> so, but it was great because the day that I, he was supposed to do it, he, I called him up and I said, so I haven't received the photographs yet and I really need you to do this. And he was like, I'm just, I haven't even unwrapped it yet. I'm just thinking about throwing the whole thing into this, this, wa this lake beside, or creek beside the Van Abbey. And I was like, well, the color is a little important to me. Could you just unwrap it? <laughs> so this is what he did, you know. And eventually, of course, he did throw the line into the water, which was kind of great because it, it was no longer a metaphor. It was just, just this abject, drippy, heavy material that floated, floated barely. And then the um, artist in Mexico City I still can't remember the name of the museum. I'm sorry. Is it Tamayo? Yes, it's Tamayo. Thank you. <laughs> and, then, and the landscape there is like a fairy tale landscape. And so the artist there then uh, used the, the line and kind of piled leaves on top of it and really incorporated it into the landscape, which was great. So this is in Atlanta. And I guess. You know, part of my claustrophobia, again, was and thinking about the ways in which um, space could be uh, the, way, the way I wanted to orient myself to a space and figure out where it was within a city and understand um, its relationship maybe to the community outside of it. So I proposed that I would take down sections of the architecture and open up this window. And then I found a group of volunteer architects. And so they built, they're called the Mad Housers. And what they do is that they, built, they build shelters for people um, to live in on, uh, I guess, throughout, uh, throughout Atlanta. And they've been doing this for, for many, many years. So I asked them to come and use the, the plywood walls that were behind the sheetrock. And then after the show, the shelter would be reassembled and somebody would live in the space. And then when the walls were taken down, you can see that the plaster behind the sheetrock carries like this beautiful stainage of the time and the history of the space. So I, you know, almost like the, the ways in which the walls would then go out in the world, I was just thinking about the ways in which to confuse where things begin and end. So I made all of these paintings. This one was on, you know, uh, on a panel on canvas of the, the, the wall itself. And then so you see on the right side the actual wall, and then 20 feet of the painted wall space went on. And that's um, a painting that I made looking out the window to the view out the window. And then 
I guess the, the, the most wonderful part of the experience of working here is that the, uh, the architects of the building took me to this fairground where they knew that uh, these, a, a community was living in these shelters. And so I visited with, um, with two of the people who had been there for at least 10 or 11 years. And one had converted, he had two shelters, so he had converted one into a library. <laughs> and the other was his home. And, and, it was, and I had made several paintings before going to Atlanta, so I gave him a painting because the shelters don't have a window. So I was thinking that that could be my gesture to a paint just thinking about the gesture of a painting and, um, and how a view could actually change the perspective, all, my perspective, and perhaps somebody who doesn't have a window. So this is the shelter after it was built. And that was the painting that was um, permanently put into the shelter. So then I came back to my, my studio, or at the same time, just work, working in the studio, and thinking about ways in which to make things a little bit lighter. You know, sheetrock is super heavy, uh, and of course, you're not always offered spaces to work in and to respond to, and to think about ways in which um, to think about or, or to use a vocabulary of architecture and built space and, um, and aesthetics and the conditions of architecture within the studio. So uh, lots of the ways in which I'm putting together, I started using window and, um, and door screens as kind of stand in for, for walls. And, and of course, there's all this kind of beautiful visual play when screens come together and, and color. Um, and the screens, of course, take in the walls and the floor, and so that you can't just see something as an isolated, you can't see the pieces as isolated and autonomous. They actually are dependent on the space around them. And I guess with something like this, I was thinking about um, about again, like urgent architecture and the use of cinder blocks, and how um, the the architecture is becomes very invisible in certain conditions, and especially like this piece in particular, like from this vantage, there's hardly any kind of coloration. But then, as you step around it, it becomes depending on where you are, it becomes um, you can really see all this kind of painted painted um, pa planes within the work itself. And I guess I use blankets and the cinder blocks and the bricks and, and wood. And, and it has this the precar precariousness of, um, of things that are put together very quickly. This is called Collapse. So I, I kind of fell in love with the screens and what they do to, um, to flat space. And so when I was asked to do a show in LA, uh, I don't know how to place this, but I guess I started um, to think about how making or slowing down the process of seeing could become more a part of my, the ways in which I wanted to respond to space. So I had started to paint outside uh, with a, an, an old easel. And I, in the beginning I was painting um, protest sites, and which was really interesting because all the kind of marginal communities um, came into the center of our town. And it was interesting because they became such a spectacle where people would just kind of pass through and photograph. So when I was out there painting these spaces, it was such a slow and subtle way in which to begin to kind of understand the conditions and understand the, the conversation and the ideas behind behind public space and behind space in general. And um, so um, continuing that practice when I was asked to do a show in LA and I wanted to think about kind of marginal spaces and the, and the built environment in LA, I decided to follow a line as an organizer. And so I followed the LA River. And it was a really interesting experience because I went out every day with um, an easel and painted with a plein air painter. And, um, 
and then I, it was just great to kind of completely slow down the experience of seeing and feel like you could, I could then kind of use photographs and, and um, collapse those into flat pa planes of color and constructed architectural spaces and combining the experience of the slow, sl slow looking and um, negotiation with uh, other kinds of architecture. So, um, so each of these pieces were made on paper and then constructed in the gallery. So this is painted Tyvek and it was pasted directly to the wall. And I guess I was interested in the way that the flatness of the colored space of, it, it just it barely suggests um, a kind of architectural form. And then the way the, the screen actually creates this kind of um, visual um, tension with that flatness. This is called Riverbed. And all of the images are um, printed on Tyvek. And I guess the weave of the Tyvek is very much like a brush stroke. So it's, they're, 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 they're interesting when you see them because you can't really tell how they're made. And they're, they're kind of flat-footed as well because um, I'm either painting on, the, painting on them or framing them within a particular language of construction or particular language of of interior space with this one, and then activating them, activating them in terms of a kind of pictorial relationship. And then I, um, I opened up the space of the gallery, and I guess it was a kind of way in which to allow the the inspiration of, of the light of the place and the inspiration of things just kind of seeping out from the, the gallery space into the alleyway, uh, allow that to be part of the, the, the ways in which you would experience the, the place as a viewer. So on the, on the wall is some of the landscape paintings that I made while I was there. And and I showed them on you know, pieces of the metal stud, which threw this kind of beautiful like, light onto the painting, which was great. And it, and, it, and it felt really strange and anachronistic to be doing this kind of work in relationship to the other kind of work that I was doing, which I feel like it's an interesting tension for me. Because in many ways, it, it, um, it doesn't make it doesn't make a formal, a formal kind of sense, but it makes a more kind of emotional, intellectual sense for me because it makes me more sensitive as an outsider going into a, a space and responding to, to that space and um, with my own experiences. And so then that um, this orange line that began in the interior then went out into the alleyway, alleyway, and I was just thinking about the kind of strange collage of Jersey barrier, cinder block, picket fence, and then barbed wire. And the way that, you know, the color, you know, the color itself on the wall would then kind of um, collapse into the space and kind of incorporate that into the vocabulary of the piece. And then somebody in the gallery called me up to say that it's such a shame somebody graffitied your piece and ruined it. And they graffitied it like that, you know? And I was like, oh my God. What a perfect gesture, you know. It like mimics the barbed wire, you know, it's kind of a double. It's, it's just so beautiful. And, you know, the great thing about this Tyvek is you could just peel it right off the wall and it's perfect, you know, and it, and it has like, it has the brick kind of imprint then on it afterwards and, and then the gesture that happened within the space. So, um, yeah, it's a great material for me. So then I came back to New York and decided to follow the, the edges of our city in the way that I was following the edges of the river because it seemed like the, it was, I was able to see the city or understand the differences of this kind of marginal landscape um, in, in a different kind of way. And I feel like you know in our own city, there's all these ways in which uh, the, center is, the center keeps shifting and the center, depending on where, you know, or or the edges keep shifting as well, so that the center might actually, you know, fold into the edges, and and how how the conditions, you know, especially with public housing along the edges, how kind of matter of fact they are, and what it would 
be to like incorporate that in a, into a kind of pictorial language. So these these last these pieces are in um, Red Hook. This is also Red Hook, and it's the painted Tyvek on the wall, and it's called Doc. And I guess um, I'm going to be doing a project for Prospect 3 in New Orleans. So I was just there about two weeks ago and thinking about, you know, using the condition, using architecture as, again, as a, a language in which to respond to. And it's such a rich place to think about in terms of its architecture. Um, there's about 35,000 empty houses there. And um, so I, I spent the week painting outside. And I was thinking about way, where to paint. And so I found myself painting outside of this prison and thinking about kind of institutional architecture in relationship to other kinds of abandoned architecture. So I'm not quite sure what I'll do yet, but I think that um, yeah, it was really fascinating. I stood outside of a public housing project and painted for a few hours. And I met uh, a geographer who was looking for bones because they were taking down the project. And so he pulled out these maps of the, um, the housing project. And it's the way it, the, the use of that land and the architecture that existed before there. And, and you know, I had this photograph of him holding up this map. And you could see that it used to be Storyville, which I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with that. but. You could see, um, ex you could just see like layers of land use, one on top of another. And I just feel like that was such an interesting um, conversation. And, and it couldn't have happened had I not been standing outside painting for, you know, a few hours. And, you know, the same thing happened outside the prison. It's like you just encounter and, and experience the kind of visuals of a city in a very different way. So I think I'm going to end with this and take any questions um, about my work. And I guess I also um, could talk about um, a new experience that I'm having right now at the Drawing Center, because I'm curating a program for artists called Open Sessions. So um, we could talk about anything. <laughs>
to make work that's permanent and autonomous and, and can be nomadic and can go other places without you and that you don't need to be there to kind of oversee and insert it. Uh, and I, I really do enjoy that. But you know, I, I also feel like the strength of making work for me where it's, it, it, you know that there won't be anything from it except maybe the little painting <laughs> is, is kind of, um, maybe it, it makes it feel that much more uh, special in some ways. that's part of like not wanting to be the artist who's site specific it's like it's a white box like how interest like in the beginning it seems like the vent is so interesting and then after a while you're like the vent's not that interesting it's a vent yeah, you know so right <laughs> exactly so you know well in that installation I didn't connect to the space I just put pieces in there it was an exhibition right <coughs> and um, and I guess I'm moving, I'm moving away from that connection to the white box, which is why I feel like you know, I've assigned myself this, the architecture of a city in which to respond to and to make pieces about. So in some ways, I'm going out into the city in LA and in New Orleans and in Red Hook and in Staten Island and wanting to respond to those conditions and then use that language of the built environment or, and the architecture and the ways in which space is constructed to make pieces in the studio. So you know, it goes back and forth. And I think that that is the tension that I think is maybe like just, maybe it's not even a tension. Maybe it's just landscape painting, you know? <laughs> um, but I agree with you. It's, it's sometimes interesting to find yourself in a space that has a history, like that space of PS1, definitely had a different kind of history because you could feel the building you like the the building still had the remnants of its use so then it's interesting <laughs> but other than that you know it's kind of you have to imagine you have to imagine into the space as though you would imagine into a white canvas in some ways well it's funny because you said that you know we overlapped at bard because I painted, um, when I was an undergraduate, I was in Rome for two years, and I painted along the, the Tevere and the river for <coughs> about a year. And, uh, and I loved that. I, I really adored that. And I came back, and I didn't do it for 25 years. And then I was at Bard, and I was teaching a class on landscape painting. And I had all my students buy little easels, and we went out every day. And I was just high. I just was so euphoric. And I was like, I, I just couldn't get enough of it. And talking about the, the work, and they were, you know, they were great and terrible little paintings. And, and I, but I just loved being outside, and I loved doing it. And so when I made a proposal for a grant, I actually uh, wrote about painting outside without having done it yet <laughs> in you know, public spaces. And, um, found my old easel from 25 years ago in, from Rome and pulled it out and kind of packed it up and jumped on a bus and found myself at McPherson you know, Square in DC and painting. So I just kind of threw myself back into it. So it's part of my past, which I then you know, brought into the present. Well, I guess it's interesting to me to think about the ways in which painting can exist outside of the canvas. And how, I guess, you know, the, the idea of painting invigorating real space to me is really interesting. Or painting questioning the conditions of a space. And I think it's hard. I think that, you know, that it's like a, ch it's a challenge for painting to stand up to that. And there's all these other mediums that are so much uh, more effective for, for doing that, which makes me want to use painting all the more. And maybe that's why I've returned to like really making these kind of antiquated little paintings, is that it's just like an insistence that the vocabulary comes through a kind of direct observation of place. And, and hopefully 
from that um, comes a kind of sensitivity to the politics of a place or the racial divides or the economic divides. And I'm interested in all those conversations and, and, and finding a way to fold those into a painting vocabulary. Is that all? Great. Thank you.